So welcome to the stage and um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. So good morning. Uh, welcome to a, a short update about uh, the Smart Connected Supply Network. Um, uh, my name is uh, Rutger van der Male. I'm here with uh, my colleague, uh, Mike de Rode. Uh, we both work for TNO, which is the Netherlands Organization of, um, for Applied Scientific Research. And in this quick presentation we're giving you, um, I will present a little bit more about the backgrounds and why we started SCSN. And Mike will focus a bit more on the, on the, the technology side of SCSN. So uh, maybe next slide, uh, Mike. Yeah, I want to start with this. Uh, this is really where the story of SGSM starts, which is the, the Dutch uh, high-tech manufacturing industry. Um, well, you see some examples of, of products that are made there, ASML, Five, Thermo Fisher, Philips, etc. And we are quite good in producing low volume, high mix and high complexity products. Um, on the right side, you see an example of that. Um, and, and you can see that the, the, the supply chains are really characterized, uh, uh, for example, by the fact that ASML does not produce everything the, themselves. So they really rely on um, a lot of uh, partners in the supply chain to help produce their products. And their orange dots, uh, by the way, are their expenditures in Netherlands and Germany. So uh, there's, there's several things you can get from this picture. One is the, the importance of suppliers. Uh, another one would be um, that the complexity of their supply chains. Um, and also it gives an idea about how much information is exchanged from one company to another to, to produce this very complex ASML machine with the right specifications and the right time. Um, so that's really the starting point for our uh, as, uh, smart connected supply network. Uh, next slide, uh, Mike. Yeah, if you would zoom in on the slide then, now this is the picture anybody knows. So the OEM on the left, first year, second year, etc., all the way down to the, the steel producer, for example. You can see that a lot of data is exchanged going top down and bottom up. Uh, obviously, uh, the order and the invoice, but also a lot of technical data, um, a lot of um, uh, logistic related uh, data like uh, dispatch advice, etc. Uh, but also more machine uh, data, for example, uh, measurements or steel certificates, etc. So in order to make uh, this very complex uh, machine, yeah, huge amounts of data are going back and forth in these supply chains. Uh, next slide, uh, Mike. And um, what we learned is that the the, the data exchange on the front and the back of these supply chains are pretty well organized. So um, ASML and first tier and, 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 on, and steel producer and wholesalers, they have uh, EDI connections dedicated, uh, they have uh, uh, cloud platforms, uh, etc. But if you would zoom in on the bulk of the supply chain in the middle, where you find a lot of small and medium sized enterprises, yeah, you can see that they are, don't have the, the power or the volume to automize this uh, data exchange. And that's where uh, a lot of manual labor is still involved in getting, uh, receiving data, uh, receiving a document, uh, reading it, interpreting it, and putting it in their own system. Uh, manual labor means a lot of administration, means errors are being made, and in the end, the total supply chain uh, really breaks in the middle, and that's really the, the, the big issue uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, and that's really where SCSN uh, comes uh, into play. Uh, so we've developed a communication standard for really those typical uh, uh, supply chains for sharing information uh, from one manufacturing company to the other, and the essence is to make it easy and safe and reliable. Um, and uh, Mike will zoom in on the, the main aspects of SCSN, which is the common language we have developed. 
and also more the, the technical infrastructure and that's our uh, link to uh, ideas. Yeah, thank you, Rutger. So indeed, uh, so in the Smart Connected Supply Network, we uh, developed a communication language based on all kinds of uh, standard uh, industry uh, standards. Uh, but on top of that, we also uh, created the, the infrastructure based on, on IDS. And this infrastructure is a thing which really scales the SESAN solution to a large audience. And this makes it a very powerful combination. So first you start with the, the language. We will not go into detail uh, for that because we are mainly interested, of course, in the IDS part. But uh, we did develop a, a, a semantic language uh, about all the information which could be shared in the supply chain. And nah, it's complete open source language. It can be found via the link below if you're interested. Uh, you, you can view um, down to the complete detail of what information is exchanged in what type. And of course, we did not reinvent the wheel uh, again. So what, what we did is we based uh, the standard on a lot of common industry standards like UBL and others, and e-invoicing, for example. So the other thing is the infrastructure. So you could have a common language, that's one thing, it's already very useful, but still you need to exchange those uh, messages in the supply chain in a structured way. Otherwise people are still going to send it via email and it's still suboptimal. So um, we briefly uh, research what is currently there. So at the left um, side, uh, you have a common EDI approach where two companies will connect to each other via custom connection. And this works great in the end in the beginning of the supply chain. And because large volumes of messages are going through this, these connections, but these connections are very expensive to set up. So especially for the small companies in the middle of the supply chain, as, as Rutger indicated, this is not feasible because for every new company, you need to set up a new custom connection, which is, yeah, it's, it's not scalable. So then we saw in the past five years, a solution which uh, is illustrated at the right. There are certain cloud providers which provide connectivity uh, to a lot of manufacturing companies. Uh, so you only have to connect to this uh, service provider and they will provide all the connectivity. This is much more scalable uh, and already solves quite some problems, but still there are, are some issues. And one of them being that um, if there is only one service provider then a complete industry is reliant on just this one IT company, which might be not uh, a scenario you want to have. And in reality, there is not one service provider, but there are tens of it. But then you still need tens of connections, uh, which is also not super scalable. So this is already an improvement, but we are not there yet. So what do we propose? This is a solution which is fully based on the uh, IDS uh, reference architecture. This is a four quarter model approach where we um, connect all those service providers in one network. So a manufacturing company can choose their service provider of choice and connect to them once. And because of IDS, um, we created a network which interconnects all those service providers. So if you are connected uh, to one service provider, you can communicate to the complete network. Uh, similar to the telecom sector, where you just choose what your telecom provider. A telecom provider will ensure um, that you're connected to all other um, connected parties. And similar to this uh, telecom sector, it is key that uh, the data is handled in a sovereign way and that people can trust the network. And that's the reason uh, why we have chosen for the international data spaces approach. Um, and, and this is also the way uh, our network is very scalable and we can connect lots of uh, new manufacturing companies. So in our network, we currently have about 10 of such service providers and this, uh, new service providers are added all the time. And these 10 service providers uh, have connected about 200 manufacturing companies, mainly in the Netherlands. But uh, we have the ambition, and this is a realistic ambition in our opinion, to scale to a few thousand uh, manufacturing companies in the next few years. And this is not only based in the Netherlands, but we really want to scale up to the European level. This is our goal for the next couple of years. 
and we, we did not connect only very large companies in the beginning and end of the supply chain, but also the smaller companies in the middle. So we, we, the, the portfolio of SCSN consists of companies all across the supply chain. And that's, uh, that's what makes this a strong solution. Yeah, so but, maybe to summarize, um, and I think it, the, the important message also of the previous slide is that uh, there are actually uh, hundreds of manufacturing companies that are using SCSN at this moment and, and also using the IDS uh, infrastructure for that. So it works. That's really uh, the, the key. And this is uh, well, basically a timeline of um, actually, picture of where we are now. So we are now in a transition from a project, we were a project uh, organization, to a foundation. Uh, it's a couple of days and we are there. A um, couple of the next years we want to grow uh, both in the Netherlands, uh, but also uh, with strategic partners in, in Europe. Um, in terms of uh, services, we have now a comprehensive message set that's being used. But we want to expand that to more like supply chain optimization uh, applications or maybe condition based maintenance things uh, and use the infrastructure also for those kind of things. And uh, another one, um, the growth this year, the ambition is to grow to about 400 um, uh, manufacturing companies. And in the next years, we should be able to expand that to a one in 2000. Um, but that really goes hand in hand with the, the growth on service provider level because they are really uh, you know, the accelerators for growth. The, the more service providers we add, the more rapidly the, uh, the network also grows. So I think that's it uh, for now. Uh, if you have thank you very much, add, uh, Rutger and Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it seems my laptop decided to go back to work again. So uh, uh, with proper equipment, let's um, go on here. Um, the next one who will present is um, Olatz Mediavia from SQS. Uh, good morning, Olatz. I will uh, give you the presenter's rights. Um, mm -hmm. Because as, as uh, we already said um, in the introduction, the solutions that people now build for SCSN and also for the use cases that we'll see later today uh, will have to be certified. And this will have to happen in so-called ev evaluation facilities. And uh, SQS is one of our uh, members who are dealing with this. And Olatz will give us some more insights uh, on that. Feel also free to share your web um, cam if you uh, feel comfortable. Otherwise, uh, stage is yours. And we're looking forward for your insights. Um, okay, hello. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so, hello. Uh, I'm Morat Media Villa. I'm the responsible for IDS team in SQS. And what I'm going to present the, the infrastructures we have developed for IDSA. Um, first, we have the, the evaluation facility where we are in charge of the independent evaluation of core components. Um, needed to get an, an IDSA uh, certificate. Uh, here we evaluate that the component uh, complies with all the certification criteria given by IDSA. And on the other hand, we have the, the integration test camp where we offer a remotely accessible infrastructure um, open for everyone uh, on a monthly event where participants can test the interoperability of pre-commercial components in, in a production-like scenario. So first, let's see the, the evaluation facility. And let's see the, the steps you need to, you need to follow uh, to get the component uh, evaluated. Uh, first, we recommend to have a preparatory phase uh, to be sure that the component is, is ready for this certification. Uh, for that, first, uh, you might select the security profile uh, your component uh, will have. Um, this depends on the security requirements developed on the component and the application that the component is going to have. Uh, there are three security profiles, as you can see, uh, base, trust, and trust plus. Uh, and well, here we have the definition given by, by IDSA in the IDSA uh, white paper certification uh, document you can find in Jive. Um, 
Then uh, we also recommend to perform a self-assessment. Uh, well, well, you can do it uh, with, uh, with a checklist uh, that SQS uh, would provide. Uh, we have a checklist for each uh, security level. Um, here we can see an example where you have the, the requirement, uh, then uh, how it could be reviewed, and then the checkboxes to say if it's documented or implemented and where to find the evidence of that. And with that, uh, you can uh, see if the component is, is ready to certify or if something is missing. And then finally, uh, the applicant must be sure that uh, it has all the documentation needed for the certification. And this consists on uh, the, operational, the operational guidance, the life cycle uh, documentation, the development documents, and the testing documentation. And then uh, once you are sure that you have uh, all this, uh, you can uh, fill in the application form and send it to, to SQS Evaluation Facility. Uh, you can find this form in, in, a, in a web page and also you can uh, ask for it uh, by an email. Uh, and when we receive it, we will review that all the documentation, for, uh, all the documentation uh, are complete and, and we will develop a validation plan for each case. Um, if you haven't uh, finished the development, you can also contact us and we will elaborate a validation strategy in parallel to the development process. Mm -hmm. So then once the, the, this validation plan is, is agreed, uh, we will request for the component in, itself and uh, we will start the, the evaluation process. Um, on that, uh, first we receive the, the, the documentation and the components, and we assess the installation and operational uh, guidance. Uh, then we also assess the development process carried out by the developer of the component, and then we assess the security requirements against the, the criteria catalog. Uh, and evaluate the test coverage achieved by the development team. Uh, the result of this documentation and code review will be uh, the input to elaborate a customized and accurate testing strategy. Uh, and with this input, the test infrastructure is, com is configured to meet the specific component requirement and the test plan, including uh, this functional and security uh, testing activities and also a uh, vulnerability assessment. As you can see here, um, there are two teams involved, uh, one for the documentation, process and code review, and the other one for carrying out the independent testing part. Um, all these activities are carried out for Trust and Trust Plus uh, security profiles. Then for base profile, uh, as it's a lower security profile, uh, we, we have less activities, just uh, one, uh, four, and four, five, and seven activities. So or in total. Um, then the, the preliminary duration of this evaluation process of all these activities we have seen is, as you can see here, five weeks. And well, uh, if we encounter any error during the evaluation process, uh, it will be reported immediately. So the development team has the chance to provide any uh, justification or clarification for it. And then as a result of this evaluation, SQS will elaborate an individual evaluation report that will be used by the certification body as evidence to, to issue that component certificate. And then after three years or earlier, if, if the component has any changes, the recertification is needed. Uh, for that, if, if we have uh, small changes in the, in the component, um, evaluation facility will have to verify that the changes made are not likely to cause any violation of the uh, certi certified uh, requirement. And if larger changes have been made, uh, recertification will be needed focused on these changes made. 
And then if there are no changes uh, after uh, three years, uh, the certification renew renewal will be needed. Um, this information about the recertification is uh, actually being discussed uh, in, in IDSA. This is why I have uh, put there that it's not really an official uh, information. And well then, uh, as I said in the beginning, we are also in charge of the integration test camps. Uh, here we, we offer a remotely accessible infrastructure uh, open for everyone uh, once a month and their participants can test the interoperability of the pre-commercial uh, components in a production-like scenario. <clears throat> uh, you can uh, sign in to participate, uh, contacting us by email or in the form uh, you can find in our web page. Uh, this test camp are uh, thought to be thematic and focused. In the first one, uh, we had the interoperability mainly between connectors. Uh, we tried the, the handshake. And, and in the next one, uh, we are planning to have uh, also a, a DAPS in the facility and try more uh, that management. Um, and then uh, we will try to add a broker and, and keep adding uh, IDSA components. So, so we are trying to build a complete IDSA reference architecture where everyone could test the, the interoperability of uh, its components. Here we can see the resume of what we have now and what we have planned to integrate in the lab. Um, we now have uh, four connectors based in the trusted connector with IDSCP communication protocol. Um, then we also have a provider connector with HTTP. And uh, we have the DAPT and broker but as a service. For the next test camp, we uh, plan to, to add a, another HTTP a connector and also a DAPS so, so we can uh, try with more uh, test cases and then we will uh, install the broker and well, the app store and, and so on. Um, here we can see the resume of what happened on this first edition. Um, main participants took part and they were able to, to perform mainly the handshake process but also uh, some certificate management, uh, connection failure scenarios, and, and the connection with more than, than one connector. Uh, we faced some, some issues in the test camp and we had uh, the feedback from all the participants and, and uh, with the, the feedback we have learned to, to the next, uh, for the next editions. And uh, we are thinking about uh, publishing uh, more information about the test camp in advance, not only how it will be managed, but also the scenarios considered and the test cases uh, we, we will try to perform. Um, then also have publicly available APIs before uh, the test camp, um, offer available machines in the lab environment so we can try the connection uh, of the component <clears throat> in the same network and then try with different networks um, and will improve the lab environment adding new new connectors uh, and also uh, developing more features to the existing ones and uh, trying to make uh, groups of participants with similar necessities so they can also try the interaction with each other uh, not only with the connectors we have in the lab and um, well, this was all from my side. Thank you very much, Olaf, for uh, these insights into the world of certification. Um, just to add for, for those of you who attended now and listened, um, <clears throat> there's a thing called ideas ready statement. So some, some pre-certification and um, there's already two members who achieved this uh, pre-certification um, signature. It's Deutsche Telekom and German Edge Cloud. Um, I think um, Bernd Fondermann will in more or less 30 minutes plus something 
uh, also present their uh, solutions where you can see how an idea is ready um, uh, stated connector will work and also Carsten Schweicher from Telekom will do so. So again, thank you very much, uh, Olaz. In case you want to certify maybe all you uh, or pre-certify your own um, components already, if you have anything already implemented, uh, contact uh, SQS or send an email to us and let us know. Next in the list is Jörg Lankau. Jörg, good morning. I give you presentation rights, um, so you will be able to share your screen. And Good we're looking morning. forward for some insights into essential components. So basically making the IDS run is a thing that you are doing. Thank you very much, Christoph. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, loud and clear. OK. Hello. For the moment, we cannot see your um, screen, uh, but now it's coming. Yeah. OK. That's the You're good to go. OK. Hello, everybody. My name is Jörg Lankau. And, um, I'm an employee of the NICOS and I'm a managing director of NICOS and Research and Development. And I try to spend some thought today about this topics here shown as Dubs, Paris, and Gaia Box, let's say the uh, linked data platform idea of IDS. Uh, and I also put in the uh, IDS G, but in one second, something more. I, I want to show you what uh, NICOS is normally doing at more than 4,000 places and a lot of locations in many countries who do uh, services networking right worldwide for our customers. And I'm very, very uh, happy to show you here on this slide one, one little thing on the left side, the 24-7 Service Operation Center, SLC. And in the red column, you can see also managed CM. So um, it's a very new idea um, because to I'll put some more things mm -hmm. like cyber defense also for our customers also. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the future we are able to do some things for IDS services connectors also in this way. So let's start. Uh, I want to make it very brief today and if you are interested in any topic and if it's not in enough here explained or whatever, please get in touch with me, get my email address or my um, uh, uh, mobile number by uh, from Andreas Kimbügler, no problem, you're welcome. So uh, as I've seen, um, Sebastian Steinbus, the next one in line, uh, will say something about the IDSG also. So I will skip this here very, very brief, but explain it on the DAPS because the DAPS, the Dynamic Attributes Provisioning Service, is one of the hearts of the identity providing things in brief. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this steps, it is a service and it will provide some additional information regarding your connector. Uh, let's say you are very fine, you're very secure, you understand what usage control is and all those things coming out from the certification of the certification body. So we decided some years ago that it's a good idea to put in those additional attributes not into the X509, so the technical certificate, because if something is upgraded or downgraded or whatever, you have to revocate the, uh, uh, the certificate and that is a very, very expensive and very complicated thing to do. So uh, I will show you, I will explain that DAPS is well it's understood and it's well documented in the IDSG. It's a GitHub repository. Please, if you're interested in, have a look at the draft branch because the master branch isn't working so far or not, is not in a good shape, but the draft branch shows us what the idea, the technical idea of DAPS may be. So we now we call it DAPS version two. And here at Nikos, we are able to make it up and running, the Stubbs version two, because I need it for my own uh, use cases and my own, uh, own play arounds like IDS LDP, Gaia Box. Uh, we come to this point in one second. So I will skip this one here because maybe um, Sebastian Steinbus will uh, explain a little bit more about IDSG, but uh, one of my, um, I, I think one of the most important Impressive points for me is that it is not a copy of the reference architecture model. It is not a copy of the information model. Uh, it's the technical truth, and it don't 
but won't uh, eliminate the discussions on IDS Jive. IDS Jive is the, uh, let's say, the internet solution for the IDSA members where we can put in some documents and make some docu uh, communications and discussions and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of uh, things you can see now in IDSG, it's coming out from documents like the communication guide or the handshake document and all this stuff uh, for those closed shop things in uh, IDS Drive. And we will show it in IDSG and make it public. This is a very strong point. And I think uh, Sebastian Steinbus will uh, say something more about it. The next topic is the participant information system called PARIS, PARIS, it's, it's an acronym. And um, what is this? PAR is about, it's a service, it will be maybe browsable for humans too, but also be uh, infrastructure component called by other connectors or brokers or whatever. And it holds all those informations about the participant of the IDS ecosystem. Let's say like Deutsche Telekom or Zik AG or maybe Nikos AG as a participant, as a participant certified by uh, let's say PWC. And um, this is um, uh, the next point I figured out here, starting with a participant. Uh, if we want to bring it in the service, we have to have a better understanding what a participant is. Most of those um, things about the participant, it's main site, it's main person to contact, and you know, all this telephone and email stuff or whatever else. Uh, is well known and well written in the information model of the IDS, but there are some points coming out from the certification body. And these days we try to fix it with uh, people like Nadja Menz from Traunhofer Focus or uh, Alexei Rezetko from PwC. And we try to find out, out if there are maybe some attributes also already not in the I, uh, information model and we will fix this. This is the next step. So we put this part is also in the IDSG. Don't forget more in the uh, manner of, of a technical understanding. So um, my last thing is here, the linked data platform. For those of you who are interested in what is linked data platform. So please took some of the uh, links I Put in here also it's a very it's not so easy to explain but maybe you can, as you can see it here let us understand it as a as a platform where you can manage resources and those resources are not only uh, resources like a, a file like a jpeg file or whatever but also resources in the manner of let's say mm, things that are happening in the information model also. So let's say an instantiated connector um, written down by the information model, you can host it also there. I have to stop here. If you're interested in or want to be, want to get in touch with me, please do it. So um, this is the main idea of a linked data platform and the guys from, um, uh, from W3C have a very interesting, uh, spent some very interesting thoughts what the use case and the requirements for LEP might be. And we try to, uh, we try to bring IDS LEP uh, maybe to a, a Gaia X use case also. We have to work on it. When I say here we, I, meet, I mean uh, Sebastian Bader from Fraunhofer and myself, we started a, a document in Jive. Also, who is interested to discuss with us there, please come to it. and. Uh, this Gaia box is only a fancy product name from Nikos. Okay, uh, um, at the end, it's an IDS LEP solution, and we have a fancy product name for it, and we have registered it in Germany, EU wide, and also worldwide. And as you can see it here, Peter Altmaier, have a look at the red one, this stopped one. It's Gaia box, P A L Peter Altmaier, the German Chancellor for um, Economics. Uh, sorry. Ministry for Economics guy. And uh, also Sebastian Steinbos is working SST. So we try to bring uh, Guybox at this point to the cloud. We are working with grid scale there. And you can see uh, at the bottom of this page, the location is Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, it's a very interesting point because uh, the guys from the Gaia X try to get, uh, try to hold data in Europe. So, um, Let's say what are the user stories for the IDS LEP Gaia, Gaia box stuff is um, data pool and so on, file storage as you see, and some very interesting use cases and requirements as I mentioned before. Uh, I think 
here you get some future features. I think, uh, Andreas, is this slide given to all those who are interested in? So I don't want to say what is happening here. Um, I think you will see that there are some things regarding the access control by policy decision points and maybe usage control also. We try to bring some features uh, into service, let's say working functions to uh, make some policy enforcements also. If someone is interested in this, uh, technique, please get in touch. And I think that it is, yes, made by Sebastian Stein was very, very nice. I love this picture. <laughs> and if you're interested, you can do it by yourself. Here's some appendix, uh, some of those links, and I'm done. Thank you, Jörg. Even uh, like 40 seconds before your time. Uh, thank you very much for no these insights. <laughs> so these were, uh, as you can guess, now easily uh, some more technical insights on uh, what happened, uh, not only in the launching commission, but already some time before that. Um, so Jörg really brought it together, like essential components as DAPS and uh, Paris. Um, and work together with a connector in this case called Gaia Box, uh, which also uh, bridges the topic IDS with uh, what is happening currently here in Germany and Europe um, related to Gaia X and IDS. So uh, thank you very much, Jörg, for these insights. Um, the next one who will present is Sebastian Stein, was our um, CTO. And um, he won't talk uh, specifically uh, specifically about one use case, but as I said in the introduction, um, he will show you what we are doing on a theoretical level. So Sebastian is uh, in charge of um, preparing the so-called rulebook, where we bring together technical descriptions, organizational descriptions, and legal descriptions. And um, Sebastian, I can see your screen. I hope we can also hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. So stage is yours. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, so much. And uh, of course, thank you, Jörg. So now you are all aware that I am running on Ubuntu uh, Bionic Beaver uh, with long-term support and that I like to build Gaia boxes in my spare time. Um, but now I want to uh, give you a brief overview about the state of play of the IDSA rulebook. Uh, the IDSA rulebook writing is uh, part of the launching coalition as the web stream 3. And uh, so, so where are we now? Um, when we take a closer look uh, at the uh, milestone plan, at the schedule that we have, uh, we started in mid of March with writing the rule book. And uh, I think we had a very clear idea of what we wanted to achieve until September with the first version of the uh, IDSA rule book. Um, because there were things missing that we do need to come from uh, the reference architecture model as a generic approach how to build data spaces uh, and then how to implement it in real world scenarios and uh, this gap that was or that is there is intended from the beginning on um, but we have to close it uh, we have to really show how to bring IDS really into life um, and uh, therefore, the rulebook targets basically uh, three different uh, kind of uh, participants or people or stakeholders. Uh, and the first one is, of course, the participants inside the data spaces. It shall be a guideline how to get into the IDS, uh, to understand how IDS scenarios could be implemented. Um, what is the difference between the generic description and the real world implementation? That means, for example, that we do have to describe uh, what those essential services are and why they are so relevant and necessary to set up a real world use case. Um, but also, we had to work on operational guidelines. Um, how to really bring IDS to life from an operational point of view. Uh, so what is my job? What is my duty? What are the touch points I have to take uh, to become a, part a participant inside the data spaces? Uh, I think you are all aware that, of course, you need to develop or buy something like a connector or something similar, a component uh, that makes you part of it. And you need to uh, become certified. Uh, for your operational environment, but also for the connector or the core component that you are using. Uh, and then there is something like uh, this digital identity, and it has to be related somehow uh, to your certification, and it has to be 
uh, come transparent to all the other participants inside the idea. So what is my duty here and whom do I have to connect to? What are the things, the documents, the artifacts that I have to deliver? Um, and on the other side, um, the providers of those essential services, they have to be very clear about what do they have to build? What are the services that they have to provide in a pure technical way? For example, what is the API that I have to provide? Um, but also from the perspective of uh, policies and rules and SLA. So what are the policies that I have to stuck to? Um, for example, is any downtime of the DAP service um, possible or not shall be available all the time? And also to which uh, public available policies uh, does all those services relate? Um, and then, um, Later on, also, um, Lars Nagel will provide some ins uh, insights into the support organization. But what is the duty here of the support organization? This is something that we are clarifying inside this uh, web stream of the rule book. What are the duties, the responsibilities of the support organization? What has to be done? Uh, as Jörg already stated briefly, um, so I have a certification, and this is paper. Uh, how does this paper get into those services, the participant information service, the dynamic attribute provisioning services? Uh, there has to be something in between, a person that fills in the data, a tool that uh, translates the data, whatever. So how do those processes look like? How can we verify the information in between? How can we instantiate a certification body um, to really um, control and monitor the uh, evaluation and certification process. These are all tasks that we have to do and describe inside the IDSA rulebook. Um, as of course, for the instantiation of the data space uh, idea, um, in this world that we are talking about um, with the IDSA support organization, but at the same time, it's a blueprint uh, for every data spaces approach. Uh, if you're going to build an own data space inside your company or inside your community. What are the things you have to do and what are the things you have to set up and what are the things you have to define? Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you are still on the milestone slide since I got some questions if uh, you switched already through some slides or is it true that you're only showing this slide for the time being? I just show, show this slide for the time being. Um, because I think okay. it's really important. But of course, yes. I can switch the slides, and I will do later on. Uh, so no <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> we just don't want to miss any slide of yours. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And then, of course, we will provide the slides afterwards, uh, as you like. So uh, last important point on this slide is um, that we do have regular touch points. Uh, we also scheduled already two reviews. And uh, we will uh, switch our bi-weekly meeting that we do have uh, during the summer period from Monday in the afternoon to Monday in the morning, starting at 10.50. And now let's see if I can switch slides. So now you should see a new slide. Uh, so what are the achievements that we have so far? We have planned a little bit uh, what we want to achieve uh, within our three milestone that we have planned, uh, end of April, end of June, and then end of September. And uh, when you take a closer look at our milestone plan for end of September, uh, the version one of the rule book will not be the final one. We are completely aware that we cannot define everything that is still necessary uh, during this time period starting from March until September. Uh, there will be some things open. Um, so just for expectation management. Um, but we have achieved a lot already. And uh, I will go a little bit through the, basically these are chapters of the rule book, the substreams inside the rule book. Um, so I mentioned here the introduction. So why is the introduction that important? One, may, um, uh, one might ask. So it is really important because we have to really clarify what is the purpose of the rule book? What is the scope of the rule book? What are the goals of the rule book? And this has to be perfectly clear. What is inside the rulebook? What can I expect from the rulebook? And what not? What do I have to define inside my own world? So it's really important to really clarify on this and have to really a common understanding uh, inside the IDSA and inside the launching coalition and to provide this to the, to the public later on then. Um, then the second stream is uh, on the functional agreements. Uh, so basically, what are the roles inside the inside these data spaces? And uh, of course, we have already defined those um, 
inside the reference architecture model, but there is something on top that is not part of the reference architecture model. The so-called essential services and the base services, things that have to be in place uh, because otherwise the data space will not work. We have to clarify on this, and I put a red action mark on top of this because we have to get a little bit clearer on this. What is the responsibility of the um, uh, essential service and the base service, and why are they so important? We have to become more specific here, um, yeah, and we have to work on this. We are working on the technical agreements. Most of the technical agreements are already described in the reference architecture model. Most of them are already provided in specification that we provide, um, but some things are missing. And uh, I'd just like to mention two of them. Um, the, first one, the first one to mention is uh, public specification of setup service that we are working on IDSG currently. Uh, this is really important that this has to be very, very clear uh, to describe this uh, DAPS version 2.0. The second thing <clears throat> is about the certification and the testing for components. So how do we, can we conduct an interoperability test? This is something that is um, missing yet and where we are working on uh, heavily to provide this uh, interoperability test. And then we have this uh, most important section about the operational agreement. So how is the governance uh, um, inside those data spaces, what is the relationship between the bodies of the association and the support organization and uh, any other service providers. We have to describe this more clearer. Uh, how are the operational agreements with regards to administration? As already mentioned, uh, how does this administrative workflow look like from uh, I want to be, become a participant, I have developed the connector, I am certified, and now I want to be published in the participant information service and the DAP service. And what we have to clarify is on the maintenance. So how will the standard in the future re be maintained? So maybe while you're not talking, you might mute yourself. This could help, I think. Um, so um, the maintenance is important because we want to have a, re a reliable standard. And uh, if we tend, as developers sometimes do, publish a new version every week uh, or twice a week or every month, uh, this might not be helpful uh, for someone who wants to provide a reliable service on top of the IDS specification. So we have to agree on things like how do we uh, work with version management. We need something like a clearer release plan and uh, we have to maintain this release plan and we have to incorporate a better change management system. Uh, this is what we are working on there. And we have to provide uh, the operation agreements with regards to the policies. So what are the policies? Uh, that uh, companies or service providers have to be stuck to. And last but not least, the legal agreements. So what kind of legal agreements have to be in place uh, to provide the data space? And this could be in the first step, of course, be something like a code of conduct, something that everyone has to uh, sign that, of course, I will be stuck to the basic rules of the data spaces and I will not use the data uh, in another way than it was intended to be. So, and also here is where we have to speed up a little bit, but to work on those legal agreements, we have to provide a little bit more details on the technical side and on the government side. Um, a few more, more words on IDSG. Jörg, you already um, told something about uh, IDSG, and uh, I just want to append a few things here. So IDSG is really public available, it is usable by everyone. And uh, it shall represent the current public available version of the IDS specification. So everything that is written on IDSG is fact. And there's a difference between what is written on IDS Jive. IDS Jive, the internal um, system for uh, IDSA members, there we will work on the things and we are defining things. And things that you implement based on IDS Jive might be subject of change. So it might change. What is written on IDSG, this is reliable. And you will be uh, aware that when those things change, there will be a period of time to adapt. So it shall be far more stable. And of course, it's the first point of contact, as you have already said, for developers. Uh, you will find every specification details you will need. Not today, we are still working on this, and help is more than welcome uh, to provide more details here. Uh, but it shall be really the first touch point for developers. And what is uh, also important, not only for developers, but also for everyone else, we provide a glossary, a stable glossary that is linkable. For example, if you want to cite a uh, a definition of data sovereignty. You can find the IDSA definition of data sovereignty inside the IDSG gloss glossary and link it there. If you want to 
uh, just say we need something like an IDS connector. You can link the definition of an IDS connector, and from this glossary, you can follow to all the specification. That doesn't that does mean you don't have to write everything you need uh, on your own, but you can cite all the definitions that we provide as ID, IDSA. And uh, yeah, if you want to get into the details, just check our GitHub account, International Data Spaces Association, and then follow IDSG. Uh, you can also find the IDS information model now on uh, IDS on our IDS GitHub representation. Next steps. Of course, we are working on this, so we need your feedback. Read the content of the rulebook, try to understand uh, the rulebook and provide your feedback, provide your content. Uh, we are free for this via our Teams channel, via email, contact uh, Julia or me. Uh, we are also working on Jive. And the next touch point uh, that we will have is the next contributors touch point today in the afternoon. Um, we have to follow up on the operational agreements on the maintenance part. We start with the discussion and have very good content already, but we have to clarify still things. We are working on the Dutch specification in detail, and we are planning a workshop on operational agreements on the policies. So, and in the meanwhile, keep calm, read the rulebook, uh, join our Teams channel, find the current draft of the rulebook uh, in our Teams channel, and if you like to participate in our B-weekly touch points, and uh, you are even welcome when you want, just want to listen and try to understand or get a better understanding of what we're doing inside the rule books. Um, that's very, very welcome just to listen and get a better understanding. And now I'm done and back to you, Christoph. Thank you, Sebastian. Just in time. Um, thank you for this introduction of the rule book. I think it's really a, a hard component, a core component of what we're doing here currently. Uh, at the IDSA, uh, within the launching coalition especially, um, allowing those who will come later and are maybe not the very, very first ones to uh, implement uh, components to follow uh, a, a reliable um, guideline on how to do things in or with IDS. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, next one in the list, and with that, um, so we, we saw already now some uh, essential components, um, one use case to motivate how things uh, can move with the IDS. Um, the uh, following um, pitches will be more about the use case uh, point of view. So next one in, in the list of presenters is Carsten Schweichert from um, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, and Carsten will give us some more insights on uh, what is called the Data Intelligence Hub from Deutsche Telekom. Um, Carsten, you should be able to take the screen. Yeah. We at least can see you, not hearing you yet. Let's see, maybe. Hi, this is my voice. This is your voice, Works. yeah, perfect. So Now only the screen is missing. My voice, where are my slides um, <laughs> today? You are only completing oh, yeah, something your is... voice, face, and slides. And slides, yeah, it's a triangle. <laughs> um, wait a minute, should work. We try this and I press the screen. So if you could. So now we can see PowerPoint, yeah. I try the presentation mode. It becomes slowly here. Yeah, I had the same issue. Are you sure about uh, that Telecom doesn't suffer from any bandwidth problems today? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's it's, it's written good. in my contract, I have to say it, okay. <laughs> um, so, here we are, hopefully. Yes, so, perfect. See the presentation Stages, yes. mode of my, of my slides. Yes. Thank you. Thank I have you very much. about 10 minutes, is this right? That's correct. Okay. So a short overview, Telecom Data Intelligence Hub portfolio. So I tell you our short story about a, a commercial product on the market, which includes some data sovereignty services uh, I will show you. And uh, based on this um, based on this product, uh, we uh, show two launching coalition use cases based on this. Uh, deep dive will follow by 
on one of these use cases will follow by Chris. So what is our data intelligence hub uh, portfolio approach? Uh, so it is a portfolio uh, of combined services and the focus, the key focus in this case is data analytics. So our goal is to um, support ecosystems, customers, whoever uh, to uh, do more and easier data analytic uh, use cases. Uh, for this reason, uh, we are going to provide data from as, an, as a broker, from provider to consumers, from, from data providers to uh, data consumers uh, in a data catalog uh, with or without marketplace uh, um, functionalities uh, up to uh, monetization uh, capabilities. Um, attached to this, uh, we offer cloud workspaces, so secure workspaces on your own, uh, on demand uh, within the cloud, and these workspaces uh, are already uh, equipped with um, data analytic tools and data analytic libraries. And as a third approach, you find already given data analytics algorithms or uh, apps uh, into this environment. Um, because high value data is only uh, given or available in a trusted environment, we decided very early uh, to set uh, uh, to um, to build this on the trusted environment of the IDS reference architecture. So, so trust, openness, and who demands that data sovereignty uh, are important um, are important success factors to make high value high valuable data available. And only with high valuable data, you get high valuable analytics on it. This is the key idea of uh, the services we put together in the uh, product portfolio. We we are uh, we call uh, we call it data intelligence hub, and it's on the market. And you can use it. Um, let's have a close, a short, uh, but close uh, view into our business model approach. So data, as I said, data analytics offerings. Uh, and ecosystems built on this to support this. On the inner circle, on the left-hand side, you see our data intelligence hub offerings, so our infrastructure services, uh, so data catalog, data markets to provide the data, the toolkit and workbenches with pre-configured environment. Uh, you can uh, have a kind of experience like data analytics to go, so you don't need anything else can dig in here and start to uh, use, for example, Jupyter or other tools in your own environment. Uh, for to, uh, um, okay, and some some insights of pre-configured solutions. Um, one of the use cases uh, we show here in the launching coalition uh, is in this lives in this environment on the left hand side. It's a data marketplace approach applied to uh, data sharing of uh, traffic light data um, and other uh, uh, light data in the city of Barcelona and Spain. Um, so this is one of the use cases. Partner solutions, so the shadowed, uh, the shadowed gray environment here is the extension that you apply this infrastructure to customer specific projects or customer specific environments. Here's a second, here lives the second uh, use case where uh, Chris is going to show uh, a short in, in one of the next presentations about mobility and the mobility environment of the German national platform for new mobility. Um, this is uh, where you plug in this infrastructure in a broader environment uh, with other services and use the building pieces on it. The outer circle, the big circle, which is uh, named advanced analytic services, means 
that we are going to, we, our partners, are going to offer uh, workshops and data science consulting on in uh, based on this infrastructure. Uh, and we are going to offer and drive uh, customer-specific analytics projects, means data engineering development. A third use case not yet um, uh, known, uh, known to um, mention for the launching coalition, which is uh, uh, worthwhile to mention here, is that um, living again in this partner environment uh, is the Umati use case uh, of um, the German Machine Building Association, VDMA, where we are the partner for um, sharing um, machine um, machine data across uh, the different uh, machines and machine producers. Maybe it's a it's a good idea to have a, a discussion uh, with the first presenter today on the um, manufacturing supplier network. It could be for both of us interesting to find out if here's a combination uh, and good idea. So let's have one look deeper what kind of uh, IDS building pieces we are using for this and uh, we implemented for this. So one of the key parts is, of course, the connector. So you can, in this DIH environment, data intelligence hub environment, exchange your data by different uh, well-known uh, data standards and APIs. But if you are going to apply data sovereignty and data control, of course, you need a data connector. So we have an MVP connector uh, ready to go uh, and uh, a roadmap on to drive this ahead and you know to uh, make the connector working uh, you need some basic and maybe essential services as we heard uh, to uh, to drive it so we implemented as uh, so we implemented and offer in this infrastructure as a as a role on solution supplier a broker and an identity management uh, which uh, gives uh, the certificates to the connector and who identi which identifies what kind of, of users are around. And we have an, an app store where you can download um, some more services into your con environment to prepare the data, for example. On the left hand side, the second role, we are offering own data as well. So telecom plays here a second role as a data provider. Uh, I have to explain at home in my company that this is a different role uh, from being a provider of an infrastructure. So this is for to to take it uh, and to, to cut it in two pieces uh, and to be aware that these are two roles. It's important you see here different uh, lines which uh, differentiate uh, between real data transport and exchange and metadata uh, exchange um, and we all uh, we organized this to make uh, clear that the different participants so the data provider and the data consumer and maybe more data partners um, uh, can organize the data exchange in the way uh, my webcam has stopped okay for what reason ever, um, in a, to, uh, it can organize the data exchange in a way uh, they are they want to. Sebastian, can you still hear me? Or uh, what is this, Christoph? Christoph, yeah, I can still hear you. I cannot yeah, see okay. you, but I can hear you. Yeah, I get the message. Your webcam stopped. So if it, the message is not from you, it's from the. Um, okay, this is uh, what kind of pieces we build and we ich have. Glaube, ich habe gerade für den einfach die Videoübertragung beendet. I try to restart it. Then you can, it works, and, yeah. And you can see me again. Ah, here I am. Uh, old fresh cast. Um, so, um, but have you please look more uh, on the slides. Here you can see what kind of building pieces of IDSA uh, we. Uh, already implemented to make this running. 
uh, close to the IDSA infrastructure and especially to the connector uh, we experienced a lot of uh, maybe uh, unexpected experiences um, uh, implementing this so happy to happy to share on this and we uh, see forward to make uh, our connector implementation interoperable and testing to other uh, operate to other implementations to make the environment completely uh, going forward uh, so should now jump to the next slide okay maybe maybe i do miss the last slide because it's not it's really not me stopping stopping you from uh, switching to the next slide <laughs> <laughs> so on the next slide the announcement is that you uh, can uh, can experience it on on yourself so we are up and running on uh, dih.telecom.net uh, and uh, there's a free trial available even with a free uh, working environment so you can uh, easily um, log uh, uh, easily log in there with your email and the, and the password you like and then you can try walking around the marketplace and the available data there's a lot of data available already most for free but some for uh, uh for license um agreements uh and you can try in your own environment some tools on it so it's uh i always say Just it is um, data analytics to go available for free immediately so yeah i'm the link the link will be included in the slides uh, that we uh, will be included yeah give you for um, upload yeah exactly so my my screen is frozen um so uh, and so the summary so the summary the summary slide is only about um we are on the market available as a, as a product price list is available for the uh, for the rich environment uh, beyond the free trial um we it, it is built on uh, uh, as i said on idsa architectures uh, mostly and extended by analytics environments and services and um, the uh, key basic services we already implemented to make it uh, ready is um, a broker um, the identity management and especially uh, um, a connector ready to be um, applied in, uh, in, in uh, dedicated projects and we are happy to um or we are going to discuss the further roadmap on this essential services uh, together in this uh, community we are here all together okay this is a short um a thank short you very much on the data intelligence hub of deutsche telecom thank you very much carsten for these insights and uh, no. maybe as a transition to the next uh, presenter, your um, connector that you presented now was the very first that uh, got the ideas ready statement. And the next presenter is um, the next connector that has this statement. So just so that you know, certification, as we already presented, is something that is in the phase of being created. We are setting up uh, the evaluation facilities, processes, and so on and so forth that are needed in order to certify your uh, connectors and other components. Um, and uh, as far as the, uh, it goes for the moment, the ideas ready statement is the thing that you can achieve. And uh, the next one, Bernd Fondermann from Drum Edge Cloud also has this ideas ready statement. Bernd, welcome. We can see your slides already. Thank you. Very good. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about uh, our ideas readiness process. Um, so, as um, was already said, my name is Ben Fondermann and I'm the product owner of our um, IDS connector uh, implementation at German Edge Cloud. Um, in case you are not aware of German Edge Cloud, um, so German Edge Cloud is part of the Freetime Low Group um, with 2.6 uh, billion uh, euros in revenue, large um a conglomerate of uh, different companies you may know the brand vital um 
or others um, from, um, from the group. We are present in 18, 80 countries and uh, over 12,000 employees. So German Edge Cloud is part of this group um, together with uh, IOTOS and Innovo Cloud. We are uh, the digital leads and we um, are acting in a kind of startup um, way to bring um, new stuff to, to the group uh, and innovation to our customers. So what, what kind of, um, what kind of um, challenges is the industrial world and also the, um, the business world in general really facing? There are a lot of, um, a lot of challenges regards to new technology, uh, new approaches, uh, di digital transformation, um, not at least uh, artificial intelligence. And we are helping to bring all these um, use cases to our customers and uh, build products around it. So one of the products I uh, want to highlight is uh, our on-site product. Um, it's an appliance, it's an edge cloud appliance, which you can buy and run in your own data center. So we will deliver a complete system um, with all you need, for example, to run on your shop floor, in the industrial setting or on other verticals we will pursue later um, in the following following months. Um, and one very uh, important part of this, um, this product um, is the integration with other ones, with, uh, with suppliers, uh, with third parties you want to share your data with. So industrial data space uh, and industrial data space connector in, um, in particular is a very, very uh, important part and um, it's already built in, into, um, into our edge cloud appliance, um, which, you can, uh, you, which is on the market and uh, you can buy it today. So um, maybe why did we, um, did we choose to build our own IDS connector? Um, so we set out to um, fulfill some um, special goals uh, and create some benefits for our customers. At first, in, in the um, industrial environment where we are, um, we, we um, need, to, need to gain acceptance from, from our users. So our implementation needs to be very intuitively usable also for non-technical users. And this is the kind of um, two sides we are looking at um, delivering the technology, but also making it uh, practical for our users to actually uh, apply it and, and make it approachable. Um, on the other hand, of course, we want to be fully com conformant with IDS standards um, and um, the system should be easy to operate. So because uh, this appliance, if um, uh, if it's running at the customer, some part of the operation is left also to the customer at the end. So um, the uh, our, uh, connector is an integral integrational component of the on-site. Um, this is what we are focusing right now. So if you buy it, you will get it uh, already delivered. Um, but we're also looking into it into making it standalone application. So because um, if you have different different needs uh, apart from having one central edge cloud system, you have um, other parts of, of your factory or uh, whatever your, your setup is, uh, you have um, additional um, connectors deployed somewhere else. So these can run with less, um, less resources needed as a standalone connector. And our aspirational goal is, in the end, to be Trust Plus certified, which um, if you looked into the certification process, this is not an easy goal. And one particular road to, uh, to go into certification is to become IDS ready. Uh, so it's not a certification, but it's preparing this process. And 
I can recommend to go this road and to um, to look into um, IDS readiness at first. It's uh, I think a first class citizen um, in the IDSA, um, and you can you can read a lot uh, about it on also on the IDSA webpage and so on. Um, so in in the few minutes uh, left, I want to. Um, give uh, give a report how what we experienced uh, down this road when we headed out for IDS readiness. I think we started um, last year in the summer, um, and we of course not did not do it alone. We um, um, we had partners on this way. Um, and I don't think you can do it without uh, any partners. So, um, so what what are the benefits uh, at first of this IDS readiness? At first, it prepares you for every aspect of the certification beforehand. Right? You don't need to already uh, opt in into making a certification. Um, you just prepare yourself and have the time and um, and all can do it uh, on your own uh, pace um, to, to achieve this level of confidence. It also makes sure that you have a plan, that you have a plan how you want to certify, what it's all about, uh, what the scope is, and so on. Um, and we, um, as German Edge Cloud, um, consulted with Fraunhofer, um, uh, like we do in other projects, uh, consulted about our design of our uh, connector. Um, and we did this in a project setting. Um, so this helped us to, to stay focused. We um, did a number of workshops um, where we looked at, at first at what we had, what we already were building at, to just get, get everything in the same boat. And then we went through every single step, every single requirement in the IDS certification. Um, and this is a very helpful uh, learning process because you get to know get to know the scope of this certification. Um, this process and this project has not been about the implementation. There was it was not about um, uh, creating actually the connector, but the deliverable of this process has been a concept paper. A concept paper where we laid down everything we learned from the requirement process and fed this back into, uh, into the IDS readiness um, report, right? Which was, which was uh, at the same time um, um, prepared by the colleagues from Fraunhofer. But of course, we did not only produce paper, um, we also could derive uh, a number of epics and uh, stories in our implementation backlog. So it, we had direct feedback into the implementation, but this is not what IDS readiness is all about in the first place, but it had uh, already an impact. We were able to directly feedback. So if you have this only in the certification process, it's a little bit late. So we had we were early on had to uh, were able to make uh, important decisions there. And maybe to sum up, what what are the learnings we had from the IDS readiness? Um, so the first thing we learned: the certification is very very broad. You can think of it like in the scope of ISO uh, 27001. Um, so it's not just about the IDS specific requirements and features. It's a lot more. Um, it also emphasizes architecture, development processes, and best practices in security uh, and infrastructure. So um, it makes really, really sense to look into um, this uh, very, very early if you want to uh, get certified. And also it might help you deciding which profile uh, you want to achieve uh, in the certification. If you want to have basic trust, trust plus profile, because there are very different requirements there. 
um, it definitely impacted our implementation and we are still uh, implementing all the learnings uh, we had from this um, right now. Um, and why is this such a broad, broad certification which goes far beyond uh, only IDS app features? It's because we really have to build an ecosystem of trust and not trust single components, but trust everything which is building up these spaces and ecosystems. So um, it really looks far beyond only your, uh, your component. So um, as a final, uh, final um, facet, maybe I want to say that we would not be able to successfully certify without being IDS ready at first. So I can really recommend this process if you look into certification. It's very, very cooperative, very, um, uh, very uh, informative, um, and it helped us a lot. Um, if you want to learn more about a product or uh, so our readiness process and uh, what we went through in this process, uh, you see my email and um, I'm happy to talk. Thank you. That's Thank all. you very much, Bernd. Perfect. Thank you for these insights. Um, so you now saw two examples of ideas ready stated um, connectors in case you want to know more about the process and whom to contact. Uh, I provided you the link in the chat section. Um, before we go into the break, maybe one um, comment. Um, in case you have questions throughout the, the day or the two and a half hours, um, please uh, put them either into the chat section or the questions section that you can find in the GoToWebinar uh, program and we will um, get back to um, your questions um, at a certain point in time when time allows that. So we are hanging a little bit in time, therefore I would shorten up the break a little bit and um, would like to ask you to be back at 11.40. That's also in the chat right now. And um, see you in a few minutes and continue with Dennis Neumann. Thank you very much. So welcome back everyone. And I can see that Dennis already uh, opened his camera. Hi Dennis. Uh, oh no, it's Sven Reitzel. Good to see you. Hey, can everybody hi, hi. Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, I will give you. I will give you presenters, right? Uh, right. So, is it you, Sven, who will show the slides also? Yes. Okay. Perfect. By now, you should have the right to share your screen. Perfect. And yeah, we can see it. Stage is yours, Sven. Hello, my name is Sven Reitzen. I'm the head of sales at Scope. First of all, I would like to give you a short overview of our software and its core functions. Then I will go into how we use the IDS connectors to take e-recruiting to a new level of transparency and security. We see this new technology as an important milestone in giving users back their data serenity. And I would like to describe the advantages that we believe it offers both for companies and applicants. Okay. First of all, why you should care about e-recruiting. The right employees are the most important capital of a company. I think we would all agree with that, but there still remains one question. How can you win the best candidates for your company? E-recruiting is contemporary when it comes to attracting the right applicants nowadays. The younger generation in particular use Google and Code to search for jobs, often from their smartphones. So job ads must not only be found online, but must also be able to be displayed without problems on various devices. E-recruiting is therefore the most direct route to your applicants. Why else would 98% of HR professionals say that e-recruiting is the tool to find new employees. But it is also the most convenient way for your applicants to apply to you. Fact is, 70% use smartphone for job search. There are 2.7 million searches per month for Google, for jobs on Google. And they can find you directly and apply only with just a few clicks. 
So no company can therefore afford to leave this job market unused. What is Scope about? Scope is an intuitive e-recruiting software solution that digitalizes the entire process from the creation of the job ad to the hiring of a new employee. Scope is about great user experience for HR professionals and data serenity for applicants. Okay, let me show you the five core functions of Scope. First of all, there's the job ad management. Create a job ad with your company design that is identifiable to the applicants, and in this way, the visual perception of the job ad is combined with your employer brand and the mind of your applicants. Decide where it should be published. Have an overview of all achieved jobs, and you can freely choose at how many company locations the job ad should be placed. So once the application process for a location is complete, it will only take one click to deactivate this location. The data query of the job ad is individually adaptable and expandable. So assign the rights of, the, of these job ads to another user in your company is also, it's also possible. You see, you also see, here's the little eye. It's the direct link to the incoming applications to the chosen job ad. Okay, the second core function is the career site. Once we have created your job ads, you need to publish them online so your potential candidates can find them. The first point of contact is usually the career section of the company's own website. Our recruiting software helps you to present your career page in a modern, uniform design. Scope includes its own job ad ready career site for license holders, which can either serve as a standalone site or be implemented into your existing website. All of your created job ads will appear here for free. The third is the multi posting. In, contracts, in contrast to the traditional print ads, all our job ads can be distributed worldwide and are even cheaper. Depending on your industry and the popularity of your company, it may not be enough to just publish the job ad on your own career site. Thanks to Scope, you can not only create ads quickly, you can also publish them in parallel on over 400 job boards. Well, you can always publish your ads on Indeed and Google for jobs for free. We also offer you attractive multi-posting solutions if you want even bigger reach. The best approach differs from job to job. Together with our partners, we can advise you on how to achieve the highest reach in order to get the maximum visibility from your target group. Depending on your individual needs, we put together a package deal with the most suitable job portals while ensuring that you benefit from our discounted conditions. The fourth core function is the apply management. It is important for digital operation companies, operating companies to record everything to all authorized employees concerned at all times. We therefore invented Scope as a cloud-based solution to make this usable for every cooperating employee to involve the right people in the process of application. Naturally, it starts with you get the job application from your candidates. So you choose the preferred field information of the applications and look at already archived of applications to see if there's a previous applicant who is interesting for a new position. What it is like to work in a team with Go. Here's a simple example. If a specialist department must assess whether the applicant has the appropriate skills for the position, then at least one specialist must get access to the applicant data. The scope solved simple. First, you define a group of responsible employees. Second, you assign rights for HR department to process applications and communicate with the candidate. Then, assign rights to the specialist from the relevant department to get access to the applicant data so that the specialist could assess whether the candidate has the right skills. After his work is done, the specialist will give his feedback by writing a short note into the applicant profile. Now, all authorized
authorized operators can see his decision in the applicant's preview and take on their work, integrating an optimized cross-departmental workflow. When communicating the decisions to the applicant, use multi-editing. Click the applicants to the decision you made and communicate with sending emails from scope to all of them by using our, temp uh, our personalized templates. The data secure part of that is to observe statutory periods of cancellation. I will get a bit deeper into this topic later on to show you how easy we solve this. Fifth and last is the HR analyzed in our dashboard. The use of scope for your existing process offers you another convincing advantage. You can always understand exactly how successful your measures are. In order to support you in optimizing your recruiting processes, we have summarized and visualized the most relevant recruiting parameters. Which channel is used to win the most applicants? In how many cases do you actually find the employee in the end? What are the costs per applicant? Clear diagrams and infographics make it easy to understand the so-called key performance indicators. For example, you can keep an eye on the conversion rate of your job ads and compare the effectiveness of ads placed. Based on these and other information, you can optimize your approach and use your budget with maximum efficiency. How do we implement the IDS connectors? What do we have achieved now? Right now, we are GDPR compliant. As you know, since May 2018, every CDU citizen has the right to know exactly which data a company has thought about them. This takes place every time a company gets an application to a job ad. Checking compliance with GDPR requirements is a thing of the past with scope. We draw your attention to compliance with the statutory deletion period in an early stage with markings and automatically deleted outdated applicant data for you six months after receipt of the data. Additionally, Sven, at least I am not able to hear you any longer. Yes, Sven, can you hear us? Um, you seem to be muted. Hello, Sven. Sven, maybe his audio got disconnected entirely. Sven, we're not able to hear you. So it seems to be the day of technical problems, yeah. Sorry, Andreas. Thumbs up if you can hear us, Sven. No, he cannot hear us. No. Still nothing. It seems like the technical issues are a little bigger. Uh, yes, when I'm sorry, we're, we're not able to hear you. Maybe we can shift the, the wrap up of your presentation to a later point in time. Um, we are, ah, one second, one last try, okay. If I interpret the sign language correctly. It looks like you're connected back to Go to webinar, but still we're not able to hear you. Sven, so uh, in case you hear me, let's do it like that. So Alexander Abele from Zig will uh, be the next one uh, presenting. We give him the presenter's rights, and then we uh, hit a slot uh, where. Anyway, Klaus uh, won't be able to join. I will show one slide and maybe you do the wrap up uh, just uh, right after the next uh, presenter. So we 
have a nice and clean finish of your presentation, if that makes sense to you. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, so next one uh, in the list of presenters is Alexander Abele. Hello, Alexander, I give you the presenter's rights. Um, by now you should be able to take the screen and share your slides. Do you see my slides and hear me as well? Yes, we can hear you and see your slides. Thank you, Alexander. So stage is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much and a warm welcome from my side as well. My name is Alexander Abele. I'm project manager in an industry 4.0 area of SIG, which among other things promotes the topic of digitization at SIG. I'm happy to present our community use case, the horizontal supply chain collaboration. So. First of all, let me briefly introduce the company SIG. We are one of the big manufacturer of industrial sensors and have the largest portfolio of over 40,000 sensor-based solutions in the market. We focus us with our sensor solutions on three main areas of automation, factory logistics and process automation. And last but not least, in our financial year 2019, we had over 10,000 employees, which generated sales in the amount of around about 1.7 billion euros. Last year, we invested over 200 million euros in R&D. Innovation is what makes us special, which is why we became in 2016 a founding member of the IDS. But now let's talk about our community business case, the horizontal supply chain collaboration. Globalization has been growing for decades and has now taken an unimaginable dimensions with sometimes frightening effects in times of Corona. Supply chains extend over the entire globe. As a result, digital networking is playing an increasingly important role. Supply chain cannot be managed efficiently without data exchange. Ultimately, the entire material flows lead to increasingly high automated smart factories Alexander, we're not able to hear you any longer. Uh, Store no. it temporarily. Oh, no, now you're back. And you had, you had a, a, we, we lost you for a second. So, uh, sorry, Alexander, we lost you for a second, but uh, now you're okay. back. Okay, Thank you. sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, like wholesalers, for example, store it temporarily and send it in the next step to their customers on the right side. One of the problems is that vertical automation is very far advanced in the respective value stream partner. Each of them have, meanwhile, a high grade of transparency in their area, but horizontal data exchange is comparatively poor. For this reason, we still speak of data islands along the supply chain. Within the area of example uh, for water, SIG offers sensor-based shipment tracking systems. This was our initial approach, which we would like to expand horizontally, if possible, via a neutral infrastructure. You can see that. 
Here is an example of such a system which performs identification, measurement and weight determination in the flow of packages on site of four waters. We believe that data exchange requires an infrastructure that can create data transparency and at the same time guarantee data serenity. Therefore, we are convinced that the IDS architecture fits perfectly with our supply chain project. What is the actual status of our supply chain business case? Based on the assumptions about the supply chain and the solution approach via the architecture of the IDS, we started to search for potential partners together with the Fraunhofer IML to find a supply chain application that can be realized via the IDS. The partners can be seen, which we found uh, can be seen in the middle. The result is a new version of the drop shipment business of Wirt, a famous CPART wholesaler. The data exchange will be implemented step by step over the coming next weeks via the IDS architecture. Additional stations will digitize process steps, thus creating reliable transparency along the horizontal supply chain. We contribute to the business case in the form of two sensor-based application solutions, a new digital repacking station and a system for automated goods receipt. Both systems will exchange data with different members via trusted connectors using the IDS architecture. This is again the big picture in abstract form. The main target is to communicate via IDS architecture, inclusive a direct communication out of our systems using trusted connectors, which can be seen on the down right corner. As you can see, the processes in the real world is naturally more complex. But all partners are confident that the use of the IDS infrastructure will lead to unexpected added value. For example, after the successful digitization of the process flows, Commerzbank, as well part of the community, is planning to use blockchain technology and distributed ledgers to map the corresponding cash flows in the next step. This will then lead to further benefits from the business perspective. That's for the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Alexander. So even before time, uh, that's great. So we can save some since we hang um, a little bit in the schedule. Um, so for the questions uh, that you might have, uh, like I said, please feel free to ask them in the question section, put them in there and we will try to get back to you as soon as we have um, the time to do so, at, le uh, at latest at the end of uh, our presentations. So um, since, like Lars um, said, he has some other appointments at 12.30, uh, I hope it's okay for you, Chris, um, that we pull him up front. And Lars, um, you feel already prepared for um, uh, showing us some uh, slides about the support organization. Are you with us, Lars? Uh, okay, then uh, I have to prepare. So I would be fine okay, if, yeah. uh, if Chris could, uh, could make the slot now. Okay, then let's uh, pull up. Uh, Chris, Chris, are you prepared to uh, show your slides? Yes. Otherwise, Chris, I can. I am. Oh, that sounds good. Are you ready? Yes. That's good. So, Chris, stage is yours. Uh, so, now presenter is Chris Lang from Deutsche Telekom, uh, talking us through the mobility activities that he's currently driving. Yeah, welcome. Thanks so much for this opportunity. 
Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can, and we hear you. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, the message is boosting the IDSA launching coalition. So that's why I'm here today. And I'm very grateful that, you know, Lars and Christoph gave me the opportunity to present uh, to you about the forming of the IDSA mobility data space uh, community. Uh, I, I'm supported uh, from Deutsche Telekom uh, by Anand. Uh, he is also a colleague in the IoT data analytics team at Deutsche Telekom. Yeah, Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom has many different companies. You know, one company is T-Systems, and uh, T-Systems uh, happens to be actually the number one uh, ICT information and communication technology provider uh, to the uh, auto industry in Germany. So let me get started. Now, what is what is the what is the motivation here, right? For for why do we need a mobility data space, right? And what is this thing really? So let me let me get started telling you know a little story here. And, and your story starts you know from collision to a solution. And of course, the solution, the happy ending being you know the mobility data space. Um, you know the the auto business is a very important uh, industry. Uh, and let me call the traditional uh, automotive business, which is centered on uh, developing, making, selling, maintaining, you know, servicing cars. Um, it is important, you know, for many reasons. You know, the number one is it is an engine of wealth, an engine of growth, right? It is creating jobs. You know, if we look at Europe as a whole, uh, the estimates are in the order of 13 to 14 million jobs in Europe and in Germany. I think the number is around 1 million uh, jobs. Number secondly, it is also seen as a transmission of invention into innovation. I mean, pick safety standards or the latest greatest on autonomous. It's the auto business that is driving this, driving it into the useful products like an autonomous it's not healthcare it's not entertainment but it is the auto business doing it and lately you know with the global challenges uh, between the us you know and china it, it is also important as a source of power to the european uh, community and and so in a nutshell you know it, it's very valuable and and hopefully you know we, we find a way actually to uh, continue to support the industry so that the industry can be going forward a source of wealth of innovation and and power to the european union well unfortunately it's colliding that that industry is colliding with with a reality and i label it as 2030 and some will argue you know maybe that reality has already arrived i mean number one um you know we're already quite full in terms of cars, right? Um, in order for the industry to continue to prosper, it's currently, you know, settled on this requirement to have to build more cars, more cars. And, you know, thanks to, you know, investments in quality, you know, the existing cars last longer, right? So here it is, right? More cars, right? You know, they last longer. Where do we want to put all those cars? And secondly, the climate, right? You know, sustainability is a real issue. Um, you know, you talk to city mayors, you know, talk to, uh, you know, the younger generation in particular, and it has become clear that, that we just can't, you know, uh, continue on this current path of, you know, creating emissions, creating air pollution, creating noise. And, and, and finally, we also kind of, as end users, as consumers, we've gotten stuck. What do I mean by stuck here? You know, it was a great, you know, the auto enabled us actually to roam around freely. Um, but if we go back, you know, a few uh, past few decades, um, no major improvements have happened, right? Uh, in, in fact, you know, we, we were just turning the clock back in terms of the time it takes and the cost in getting from point A to point B. Um, if you look at other industries, it's very, very different, right? You know, in the old days, used to be a king, right, to have your own orchestra or theater, you know, to listen to music or watch a play. You know, today Netflix and Spotify, you know, we have at our fingertips. Now, a dramatically reduced cost. Um, so that hasn't happened actually in in the auto space. So 
So what is what do we do about this? Well, we have to reinvent anything. The solution is already emerging, and that is typically summarized, you know, under this under this label mobility, right? And you know, we all know there's a lot going on in mobility. It's electrified. We want to share it. There's micro mobility, such as you know, bike sharing and e-scooters. And there are different forms of reusing existing assets, orchestrating and recombining them to create advantages, right? So that you know, it gets better, faster, cheaper to get from point A to point B, which is multimodal, intermodal. Wonderful. Except mobility in itself, you know, could be defined as one bit coordination problem, right? Um, and, and that problem, if we slice it, you know, exhibits itself, you know, at three different levels at least. Well, there is the technology. Different technologies have to be compatible with each other to plug different partners, different components, different elements into something in order, particularly in the case of intermodal mobility, to create a seamless consumer experience. And then there's strategy too, right? Companies have different plans, right? Different, different investors, right? Different expectations. And then finally, also the regulation, uh, regulatory level. There, there, there's privacy law. You know, there is law coming from many different areas. You know, and if you go across borders, it gets actually more convoluted. So, in a nutshell, the, the one big problem with mobility is that coordination problems everywhere. But there is a solution, at least if we focus on the technology, a part of it, and that is open standards. Right? We all know open standards. Open standards have worked before in many different areas, right? We think computing. We all know Unix, we know Linux, right? If you move forward into the connectivity, the internet itself, and then you know everybody probably knows, you know, the 3G, uh, 3G standard um, that kind of created advantages across all of Europe. And the good news with open standards is, da da, IDSA, right? IDSA. And what is happening with IDSA? Well. A marketing organization has been created, IDSA, to promote it. IDSA has been very successful in converting, you know, technology specifications into a real standard that got accomplished in February of this year, and, and then uh, 27070. And this particular effort here is just part of that launching coalition, this particular effort, uh, which is the mobility community. So out of that, out of that, the mission, of the mobility data space is very, very simple. And that is to promote the open IDS standard to make better mobility happen now. So not tomorrow, it can be done actually today. So that is in a nutshell, uh, the story, how we arrived at this. Now, what are some specific uh, steps going forward? Well, the one element is to make it tangible really, right? We can say it's a mobility and we can have you know, meetings and we can have phone calls, right? And and sticking with the uh, IDSA approach is what what typically the IDSA is doing is that ideas are being actually put to paper. And so we have been starting actually to do you know a very similar thing here. So we um, started with a with an initial list of contributors to create a white paper as a tangible foundation to support. Uh, our mobility uh, community going forward. And uh, this is just uh, an initial effort. It is at various stages. Some chapters have been written, some have been outlined, and others are at a planning stage. And so we try to capture uh, different topics. So the overall automotive shift to services. We will talk about um, the new power of data in creating and um, monetizing these services. We'll also broaden the perspective beyond Germany to you know, include, of course, other European countries. And I'm very happy actually to announce that um, we've actually already started to work with KPN and TNO you know, uh, on, on one uh, chapter in particular, uh, where we uh, discuss this notion of you know, data roaming you know, across uh, national boundaries. And we also will be hitting on, you know, the buzzwords in business, such as platform interoperability and micromobility. Um, so I've been, we've been careful actually in making sure to, you know, have as a foundation 
um, very, very authoritative um, companies involved in this. So we have a strong automotive anchor with the center of automotive management. Uh, then we were able actually to win over a Barrels, which is an automotive focused uh, consulting company uh, coming out of Europe. And then strong telecom operators, you know, not just telecom, but also KPN, and of course, of course, a strong uh, scientific uh, foundation in Fraunhofer and TNO. So um, I've added, you know, my contact information below. If you uh, want to participate in this, uh, please feel free. And just give you a little outlook. You know, another string of activities will actually relate to real projects. But the, but the main focus uh, for now is uh, this particular white paper and um, project um, related to, for example, uh, NPM, the National uh, Platform for Future Mobility. Well, thank you so much. And um, I thank you, sure, Chris. Uh, Christoph will distribute the contact info here. Yes, of course. So uh, the slides, again, will be uploaded together with the webinar or the session today. Uh, to our web page. Uh, thank you. And I think your enthusiasm about this topic clearly shows that we have a huge potential here uh, to form a very good community that deals with uh, mobility and automotive. And I'm really looking forward to not only the white paper, but uh, to further activities here. And stay tuned on that via our web page. We will keep you informed about that. Thanks, Chris. Very happy. Thank you for the time. So, um, in order to reschedule a little bit and give Lars the floor um, so he will have the time to present his insights on the IDS support organization, I would like to give the floor to you, Lars, uh, if you're ready. Yes, I am and ready. Now you... Thanks a lot. Perfect. Um, so you should be able to share your screen. Stage yes. yes. I hope yeah, we can it see. is. Yeah, we see your slides. Lars, in case you're talking, we're not hearing you, but we can see your slides. Sorry for the background noise. You're unmuted, but we still cannot hear you, unfortunately. It seems GoToWebinar has some issues today. You're not the first one to whom that happens. Maybe a quick solution could be um, no audio and then uh, getting back to computer audio or phone call, whatever suits you best. Uh, that solved the issues um, the last time we had that. Hey. Now we can hear you. So you can't. Yes, you can. Now we can okay, hear you. It's uh, but you now we can see your screen and we can hear you. So obviously it is related to the presentation mode, obviously. Can you hear me, Christoph? No, we, yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Okay, so you see my slides and you can hear my voice, right? Both, it's wonderful, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. It's wonderful. So let's let's keep it like this. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy that I'm able to present uh, our latest ideas on uh, on the IDSA support organization and how to really uh, bring trust to data sharing ecosystems. Well, uh, what what we witnessed uh, in the presentations and the very great presentations before is that uh, there are a lot of very mature um, usage scenarios out there in different domains and all the value creation happens in uh, in ecosystems so 
that is uh, obviously how data economy looks like. Uh, it's uh, all about ecosystems. And as we can see from the picture of the fish in the reef, uh, it's obviously a prospering and colorful world that we are encountering. And uh, so uh, obviously data sharing is better than playing alone. That is the inside why all of you are uh, supporters of IDSA. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy about this and about witnessing the, the progress we, we all make. And now we should focus on uh, the next steps that um, that we're encountering. So, well, how to bring trust to these data ecosystems to make them even prospering more than today? Well, um, that is what we are uh, thought to be, why IDSA is out there and why we are setting up this open standard as Chris mentioned in his talk before. So the question is, okay, how can we really deliver trust and bring trust to these ecosystems? How does it work? Well, um, everyone out there wants to share and exchange data. Well, that is obviously true. Um, and this happens in ecosystems, true as well. Okay, then we need a clear governance that provides trust among the participants. And we came up with the IDS reference architecture model, which delivers exactly this trust framework. So defining all the measures and the components which are necessary to clarify and to agree and to describe all the issues on semantics, on security by design, on metadata, on roles uh, which are needed in these ecosystems. So we do have it at our hands. So and now the next step is we really have to deliver the trust on operational level. And that is what we call the essential services. And there will be in the very near future providers which will offer these services non-discriminatory following the IDS rules of procedure, which are described uh, partly in the IDS reference architecture and in the IDSA rulebook. And then, in order to um, organize the uh, service offering of these service providers, we will start the IDSA support organization to organize uh, the essential services for the users in these data ecosystems so that they can easily get on board in data spaces, in data sharing ecosystems, and make use of essential services. So that is what I talk about. Uh, here you can see the architecture stack of uh, our view on uh, data sharing ecosystems. So this is a um, very well known picture uh, or view on the world. Um, at, the, at the top, we do have the value creation, which happens in uh, in domains or cross domain, uh, there we do have the very um, well interesting and uh, uh, projects. For example, in the mobility domain, in the logistics domain, uh, as we can derive from the presentations before, um, and then uh, more uh, down the way, so more southbound we do see that there are a lot of market specific solutions and services. Then there are a lot of uh, base data services, which um, can be reused in any domain for a lot of different use cases. And at the very bottom, we see the essential data sovereignty services, which really provide trust for all these ecosystems. And these are really a few services, but they can really uh, well, provide the trust in these ecosystems, and it's uh, essentially all the um, evaluation facilities which uh, provide the, uh, everything which is needed for the certification. And uh, we have uh, three services which uh, can be well sub summed 
uh, under the umbrella of uh, let's let's call it identity provider. So it's the certificate authority, the dynamic attribute provisioning service, and the participant information system. And IDSA started and is there for uh, well safeguarding these whole ecosystems and bringing trust and data sovereignty to these ecosystems. So that is why we, as an association, as a non-profit association, are here to stay. And that is what we describe in the rule book uh, and what we establish uh, in the support organization in order to organize all of this. What is the, um, what is the uh, support organization doing? So we are currently um, checking if this will be a part of the head office or if it will be uh, subsidiary of the association uh, in any way it will be a non-for-profit activity um, and the only idea and the only uh, reason for this um, support organization is to organize the um, essential services so um, the essential services can be provided by any player out there by any company as long as they accept the rules of procedure which are described in the IDS rulebook. And then uh, it is up to the support organization um, to uh, get all these um, service providers operation in an operational mode. So we have to manage the rules of procedure, we have to perform RFQs, select, assign, onboard, offboard the service providers, uh, we have to uh, bill uh, for uh, so some service fees if necessary and we have to provide some first level support and that is why we need a separate organization in IDSA head office um, to perform these services and it is our goal to have at least one service provider per central service in place by September 5th and uh, for the time being uh, it uh, seems that we have uh, even two service providers for each of these services uh, in place uh, at that point of time. And then then we will be able to perform the, um, the onboarding for participants of data spaces. So this is the business process view for any company in any data space out there which wants to um, share data using the IDS idea and uh, well having more trust than before when sharing data and therefore we, we see that uh, he has to uh, well get get uh, his components and his organization certified he has to register at uh, DAPS uh, and he has to retrieve digital certificate for identification of the components used and the organization and he has to uh, register at a participant information system. So this is a very easy workflow, but anyway, as there are different service providers uh, involved, uh, there has to be one, uh, one organization that's, that organizes that everything happens in the right uh, sequence and that the participant uh, really ends up with uh, certified components so that he can then uh, share data in a in a data space, and that is why we need the action. And then uh, it is very important that we have certified components in place, uh, which state to the rest of the ecosystem partners that your components and your organization are working and are built according to the IDS reference architecture and therefore we do have at the moment the IDS ready assessment and we will have by September 2020 the uh, third party assessed IDS certification scheme in place so that you as companies can uh, show the outside world that you have trust and data sovereignty built inside your services. So to these ecosystems uh, becoming reality, um, getting IDS certified, and then a lot of new business, a lot of new prospering uh, in the data economy uh, happening. So thanks a lot.
thank you very much, Lars, for these insights and for uh, telling us more about the support organization. I think this is really the way we have to go in order to make things happen besides the implementation of components that we're driving currently. Thank you so much. And um, just to remind all of you, in case you have questions, please feel free to put them in the question section of uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, we will get back to you in a second. And um, thank you, Lars, again. Um, next one in the list, and we will uh, now follow uh, the agenda as it is uh, written for, for a few more moments. Uh, next in the list will be Michael Tworek, um, who will give us some insights about the implementation side of what uh, Lars now presented. Um, give me a second. So, Michael, I will give you presenter rights. You should be able to share your screen yes. right now. And we can hear you. That's a good Stage start. Zero. Can you can you also yeah, see we can the screen you. now? Uh, white at the moment, but maybe it is loading. Yeah, it it's only a white screen, yeah. Interesting. And your mouse is moving, yeah. Could be that you selected um, to share only PowerPoint. Maybe if you go to the uh, sharing menu, uh, they, there's a drop down where you can select. Oh no, we can see everything. So uh, try to go back to the presentation mode. Maybe that, yeah, it works. Stage is yours. Perfect. So, yeah, hello everyone, and uh, thanks, Christoph. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, in fact, as you said, Christoph, uh, this presentation is perfectly. Uh, um, you know, as a, can be seen as a second part of, of last introduction. Um, a short introduction for myself. So my name is uh, Michael Torek. I will um, take responsibility as CEO of Trust, Trust with double Z, as you can see on the screen. Um, yeah, and as, as Lars said, this is uh, Trust is supposed to be one of those end-to-end uh, -end, uh, service providers of the IDSA um, essential services. Um, and during my, my pitch, I will I will guide you through um, so the idea. So what is our idea behind? What is our value propos uh, proposition? What do we focus on? What not? And what is the current status of our organization? So our idea basically is um, to make IDSA consumable. I mean, there has been a lot of, lot of effort put into the IDSA uh, standardization, into the, the definition of the essential services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in fact, to make it easy and, and to make it consumable, there needs to be like end-to-end -end, um, service providers. And this is actually our mission. Our mission is to, to satisfy the, the expectations, to satisfy the promise that IDSA is creating. And, and turn IDSA from a standard into a to an out of the box experience to enable um, smooth market entry and monetization of the IDSA standard. So therefore, you can say that that we take the role of um, of the orchestrator. So with, with companies and enterprises can directly leverage our services and, and connect their digital. Yeah, whatever platforms, data lake, digital services, processes with the surrounding um, ecosystems in a secure, trusted, interoperable, and business neutral um, way. So, this is either across companies, this can be across industries, across ecosystems. So, it's about you know, making breaking silos easy. Um, and uh, yeah, we always use the comparison of, uh, of an electricity provider. Um, that is that is providing the electricity onto a normed out uh, or normed yeah, outlet, which you all know as a power outlet. And we are providing um, secure data sharing to a normed connector. Um, and, and we see it almost like IDSA as a service. So it's it's a standard as a service. And then if you if you um, you operate the standard as a service, it, it, it makes it easy. Um, to, to adopt the service, it, it accelerates its adoption. And it also means it secures the invest into all the digitization um, efforts. Um, in the first place, yeah, we, are, we deliver the IDSA compliant infrastructure as a service. It's bringing the, the IDSA reference uh, infrastructure to life. 
um, and it provides all the different modules, the essential services that have been um, defined. So as you can see, just as an example, the, the, the connector, the billing, the clearing, the depths, the app stories, et cetera. But as well, we can be consumed in a, in a modular approach, which means either you, you take a full list of components, or if you already have some of those components in your, in your core network, you can easily integrate with those that you already have. Um, we consider ourselves being industry agnostic. So we don't really uh, focus on any specific um, industry, not any specific um, use case. Um, and we have one, one important offering that I really would like to, to, to highlight, which is something that we call um, ecosystem moderation. Because in fact, this is, I mean, digitalization is not just about, um, you know, installing software, installing uh, services, it's, it's much more. And we do some, some coaching, ecosystem coaching in the beginning um, to help customers understand actually what they need, where they want to go. And after the successful integration to, to do an ecosystem moderation, which means like to, to make connections to other, um, to other partners, help them to drive new business models. So we do this ourselves with, with our team, or we work with, with selected partners like uh, management um, consultants to, to make that happen. What do we not do? So we do not interfere with our customer's business. I mean, the business model, it, um, it, it's purely in responsibility and the control of the customer. We are an enabler. We do not interfere with the customer's application. So the application development, the uh, the, the uh, user experience of the applications. It's clearly a responsibility of the customer. I mean, they know their application best, so why should somebody else do that? Yeah, most importantly, we do not interfere with the data. I mean, we, we enable the connection, but we don't see the data. We don't uh, know the content of the data. We are completely neutral here. We do not go B2C. Again, this is um, in the responsibility of our customers, of our partners. Um, and we do not govern any connection. As I said, we are there to make the connections. Once it's there, it's a responsibility of the partners to, to leverage those connections. So we are, we are in the middle of our incorporation process and we are planning to go live um, this year. So if you would like to learn more about what we are doing, our idea, our plans, um, how to become a partner, how to become a customer, or even how to become an uh, investor. So please um, get in touch with any of those uh, names shown on that slide here. That's it for me. Thanks a lot. And give it back to Christoph. Yeah, thank you very much. Back to the funk house, like we say. Um, <laughs> thank you for a very comprehensive and uh, uh, short insights into what trust is doing. So you can see clearly that things coming together, uh, not only the definition side, but also on the side where companies start building uh, essential components and even more. Um, for those of you who um, had a look at uh, to the agenda, you can tell we are already five minutes late, so we have to do some time management here. I skipped um, the slot from Klaus Utrado, that's from uh, ATOS about the certificate authority. Um, and we still owe you um, a few minutes uh, about the wrap up for um, the um, scope uh, presentation earlier. Um, I would say um, maybe Sven, we can try again if you are able to uh, share uh, the last slide of yours, which uh, wraps up things so we can close the presentations uh, from, from that side. Yeah, um, okay. We can hear you, yeah? I'm not able to give you presenters' rights because I don't have you in the list, but maybe try to share your screen anyway. Yes, yes, I will do. And sorry for the technical problems here. Don't worry, um, you're not alone with that today. Yes, yes, I will now go on to how we implement the IDS connectors to our own recruiting processes. We are not able to answer. I see you. I'm not able to, to share my screen right now. 
I made you presenter, so it technically ah. should work. No, it's, it, it doesn't function. I'm sorry. Okay. Then I have to, I'm very sorry, uh, time-wise, um, we have to skip that and uh, leave it to your slides that we also will upload to the session um, to uh, wrap that up uh, in a written form. Very sorry for that. Um, then I will take back uh, presentation mode and um, before wrapping it up, um, give you one last uh, hint regarding uh, CA, so Certificate Authority one of the important essential components where ATOS is now in the phase of organizing uh, a series of workshops for those who are eager to uh, work on the implementation of a CA and not only the implementation of a CA but also on the policy side of this story. Um, so just to inform those of you who are already part of the launching coalition, there will be this row of two to three workshops that Klaus and his team is or are organizing and we will invite uh, you to be part of that and uh, join us in the de definition of policies and CA regarding topics. So please stay tuned here. Uh, we will send around an email um, once we have the details. Uh, what brings me to the overall wrap up? Um, I think uh, the slide here um, brings it together. So what we saw today are a lot of use cases from different domains. We talked about supply chains, logistics in general, data trading and data handling um, within DIH. We talked about uh, certification, rule book, um, connectors in general, and um, connectors that uh, are also related to other initiatives like Gaia X. We talked about mobility, essential services, um, support organization, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of content, and I can tell you uh, this is only uh, the short version that you saw here. So there is more yet to come and uh, also uh, already more happened already. Um, but for uh, the time, I would say we stick to that. So the more important things that you might take away uh, when we leave uh, in a second is certification is something that is going to be real uh, until September of this year. We will have set up the essential components, not only for sandboxes and trials, and MVPs, but really as a competitive market offering. And everything that we discussed today in the past and also in the future will be written down in the IDEAS rulebook, so you have a reliable source of information where you can have a closer look in case you want also to step in into that game. Um, Time-wise, so Sebastian already um, showed um, the milestone planning. Um, the original plan was to end in September. Uh, with Corona and with uh, delays that um, are related to this, um, we now decided to uh, extend the deadline until uh, end of November and um, give uh, us and the people in the launching coalition and those who are up to join um, a little more time to wrap up things and to really make it um, good. So we want to have a first version of the IDEAS rulebook very soon. We want to have implementations of the services and we want to have certification uh, quite soon and leave some time to allow the use case side um, to also certify their components and make things up and running. And then at the end, uh, make them um, make it possible to sell their IDEAS-based products. Um, this is a graphic that I wanted to show at the beginning, but due to my technical problems, that didn't work out too well. Uh, just to flash it into your brains, uh, these are uh, not only the, the mandatory essential components, uh, which are in magenta here, but also uh, optional components that uh, are important for the IDEAS ecosystem. But for the time being, we are, uh, like you heard, focusing on the essentials. We really want to build the baseline that is reliable so that you can make your use cases happen. Uh, but there's more yet to come. And this is uh, where we stand. So what will happen next and what happens now? Uh, we will continue the refinement of the essential components and the building of the essential components, also documented in the rulebook. Uh, then, of course, we will go a step further and take it to the metadata broker, app store, clearinghouse, vocabulary provider um, that are not uh, essential components, but they're also important for the IDS story. 
uh, and bring very important and uh, interesting functionalities to you as a participant of such an ecosystem. That is what we are doing right now with this launching collision until November and with uh, maybe also launching collision iteration two or three in the next future. And what is then yet to come, and this will go in parallel to uh, some extent, is we want to enable you um, to join the ecosystem and therefore make the IDS ecosystem grow. Um, we let you in with your use cases, with your own connector implementations, with your own ideas, uh, and um, therefore you will be able to be part of a real marketable IDS ecosystem. Uh, stepwise, that means define your use case, use existing infrastructure from former uh, parts. So we heard about connectors that are already there and I'm sure you will be able to buy them uh, sooner than later. Um, so make use of that. Um, and also in the future, you won't have to care any longer about things like a CA, a DAPS, a Paris, because this will be there and ready. And um, then you can start implementing your own stuff if you like, or buy components, certify yourself as a participant and your components, and then you're good to go. You, you will be able to be part of uh, the data sovereignty game um, and will be able to drive uh, economy further and explore the value of your data really in a way where you do not lose control over um, your data. If you're interested, uh, feel free to contact us directly. If you have our email addresses and contacts, you can find them on the webpage or email to lc at internationaldataspaces.org. Uh, that's always a possibility. Uh, and for you as a member, in, in case you are already a member and you think, okay, I'm also in the game of CA or I want to build a DAPS or uh, this is really my topic, what I heard earlier today, please let us know. It's always possible to join the launching commission or also with your uh, use cases. That brings me 